Today we're talking about acid controlling medications and what the NCLEX expects you to know. Let's start with a quick patho overview. So this is your stomach and your stomach produces acid to help you digest food. But when there's too much acid, we can start to see problems, specifically if this lower esophageal sphincter isn't doing its job. This is going to allow acid to splash up or reflux into the esophagus. Now the stomach has a special mucus lining that protects it from acid, but the esophagus isn't meant to deal with this kind of acidity. And so when that acid splashes up, it becomes irritated and inflamed and damaged. And this is what we call gastroesophageal reflux disease. Excess acid can also cause peptic ulcer disease. Now this happens when the mucosal lining of the stomach is damaged or thin, like in clients who are taking long-term NSAID therapy. The gastric acid actually starts to eat away at the stomach lining itself, causing ulcers. Now, if nothing is done about this, these ulcers will get worse and start to bleed and can even go through the entire depth of the stomach, causing stomach perforation. So let's take a look at the big picture for the medications that are used to manage these conditions before we go into more detail. So we can manage acid in two ways. We can use PPIs like omeprazole or H2 receptor blockers like ranitidine to decrease acid production. Now these are taken daily and provide long-term suppression of gastric acid to treat conditions like GERD and peptic ulcer disease. We can also give antacids, which neutralize gastric acid. Now these effects are very temporary, and so these are taken as needed for relief of acute symptoms of hyperacidity. Now you'll notice that both of these medications deal with altering gastric acid. Either we are suppressing it or we are neutralizing it. And anytime we alter gastric acid, we can end up with some downstream effects, because you'll see on the slide that PPIs can increase the risk for C. diff and osteoporosis, and that antacids have to be separated from other medications by at least an hour. Now you might be wondering how these conditions relate to gastric acid, so let's take a closer look at each one of these medications and how they might show up on the NCLEX. First up are our proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs. So for these medications, we just need to remember our Ps. Think protons, pumps, and prazoles, because all of these medications end in prazole. That's going to be our omeprazole, pantoprazole, and lansoprazole. So these medications work by decreasing acid production by blocking the proton pumps or the acid pumps in the stomach lining. So do you remember when these medications should be administered? Well, that is going to be daily before breakfast. And this makes a lot of sense if we think about it, because if we're shutting down the pumps that produce gastric acid, we want to get these medications on board before clients start eating, because eating is going to stimulate gastric acid production. Now, PPIs are really great at reducing gastric acid, but remember we said that altering gastric acid can have some downstream effects. Specifically, it's going to increase risk for C. diff and increase risk for osteoporosis and fractures. Now, you might be wondering how these two conditions relate to gastric acid, and it's actually kind of simple when we think about it. So for C. diff, we need to remember that gastric acid is part of our innate immune system. It protects us from any harmful bacteria that we might ingest because bacteria can't survive in that really acidic environment. So if we chronically suppress gastric acid, we're going to increase our risk for gastrointestinal infections like C. diff because it's going to have an easier time surviving in a less acidic environment. In terms of osteoporosis and fractures, it turns out that gastric acid is actually really important in our ability to absorb calcium. So if we chronically suppress gastric acid, we're going to have a hard time absorbing calcium, which is going to increase our risk for osteoporosis and fractures in the long run. This is why we always want clients to stay on the lowest dose for the shortest duration of time. And if the NCLEX asks you about education, be thinking about C. diff and osteoporosis as really important topics we need to be educating clients about. Next up are our H2 receptor blockers. And we can recognize these because they all end in tadine. So this is going to be our cimetidine and famotidine. Now these medications also decrease gastric acid and they do it by blocking the H2 receptors in the stomach, which decreases gastric acid secretion. So just like PPIs, these are taken daily for long-term symptom management of GERD and peptic ulcer disease. And they are most effective when taken in the morning or before eating. So we can remember this with a fun mnemonic. If we look at the end of cimetidine and famotidine, they both end in dine. So we can tell our clients that they need to take their H2 blockers before they dine and don't recline after meals if they want to feel fine. So we want to take H2 receptor blockers before meals and of course we don't want clients laying down after they eat because that's just going to increase their acid reflux. 
Now, H2 receptor blockers are generally considered to be a really safe class of medication, but if the NCLEX does ask you about one of these, it's most likely going to ask you about cimetidine and its interactions. This is because cimetidine inhibits liver enzymes, and this means it interferes with the metabolism of other drugs, especially high-risk drugs like warfarin, phenytoin, and theophylline. And you'll notice that these are all drugs with a really narrow therapeutic range, and so if we inhibit metabolism, we can easily rise to toxic levels. And this is a really big safety concern, so we want to avoid combining these medications together. Now let's talk about antacids. These are going to be our quick relief options and include calcium carbonate, which is Tums, and magnesium hydroxide, which is milk of magnesia. Now these are available over the counter and are taken as needed, unlike our PPIs and H2 receptor blockers, which are taken daily. Now these don't reduce acid production, they only neutralize it. So they provide quick but temporary relief from symptoms of hyperacidity. Now, if the NCLEX does ask you about antacids, they are most likely going to ask you about administration. And so we need to know that antacids have to be separated from other medications by at least an hour. And again, this is because we are altering gastric acid. In this case, we are neutralizing it, and that can interfere with the absorption of other medications like levothyroxine and antibiotics. So we don't want to give them together. Other things that we need to be aware of is that we need to be really cautious with giving antacids to clients with hypertension and heart failure. Do you know why? Well, this is because antacids can contain a lot of sodium. So what's going to happen if we give a lot of sodium to a client with hypertension and heart failure? Well, we are going to cause fluid retention, which is going to make both of these conditions worse. And lastly, antacids can cause GI disturbances. And by this, I mean that calcium can cause constipation and magnesium can cause diarrhea. This is why we often use milk of magnesia as a laxative. All right, it's time for our first NCLEX quick check. How often should medications like omeprazole and famotidine be taken? Well, remember omeprazole is a PPI and famotidine is an H2 receptor blocker. These are used for management of chronic conditions like GERD and peptic ulcer disease. So these are taken daily, opposed to our antacids, which are taken as needed. Next up, what are two long-term risks associated with PPI use? Remember, we said this has to do with altering gastric acid levels. So we're going to see increased risk for C. diff and bone fractures. And lastly, how long should antacids be separated from other medications by? Remember, we said that altering gastric acid levels by neutralizing it can impair the absorption of other medications, so we want to wait at least one hour in between. Next up, we are going to talk about our gastric protectants. Now, our gastric protectants are used to heal and prevent gastric ulcers. Now, these don't reduce acid. They're more like band-aids for the inside of the stomach. They protect the lining from damage. Now, the stomach normally produces acid and enzymes to digest food, but when that mucosal barrier is weak or thin, that same acid can start to digest the stomach itself, leading to ulcers. So gastroprotectants work by either coating the stomach lining or boosting mucus production, which give these ulcers time to heal. Now, we have two medications we're talking about in this class, and that is sucrophate and misoprostol. Now with sucrophate, you can see that it is really important to take this one hour before meals and at bedtime, and misoprostol is absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. So let's take a closer look at these medications to figure out why and how these might show up on the NCLEX. First up is sucrophate, and sucrophate works by adhering to gastric ulcers, forming a short-term protective barrier. This is like a jelly band-aid for the inside of the stomach. It shields those ulcers from gastric acid. Now the NCLEX is likely to ask you about two things related to this medication. And the first is that timing is really important. That is because sucrophate can only offer temporary protection. So we need this medication in place before clients start eating, which is why we want to give it one hour before meals and at bedtime to protect the stomach overnight when it's empty. The second thing we need to know is that we need to separate sucrophate from other medications by at least two hours. And this makes sense if we think about it. If we're coating the inside of the stomach with this sticky jelly-like band-aid, it's going to interfere with the absorption of other medications. So we want to separate it by at least two hours to avoid any interactions. And our last medication is misoprostol. Now misoprostol works in two ways. It decreases gastric acid production and increases mucus production. So it does a really good job of protecting that stomach lining, which is why it's often given to clients who are at high risk for ulcers, like those who are hospitalized or those who are taking long-term NSAID therapy. Now, if the NCLEX does ask you about misoprostol, it is likely going to ask you about one big key safety issue, and that is that it is contraindicated in pregnancy. 
This is because misoprostol can cause uterine contractions. And if we cause uterine contractions in a client who is pregnant, we're going to significantly increase the risk for miscarriage and preterm labor. So we never want to give this to pregnant clients. All right, it is time for our last NCLEX quick check. When should sucrophate be administered? Remember we said sucrophate was like that jelly band-aid for the inside of the stomach, but it's only temporary. So we want this jelly band-aid in place before clients start eating. So we want to give this one hour before meals and at bedtime to protect the stomach lining overnight. And lastly, misoprostol is contraindicated in what population? Well, remember we said that this can cause uterine contractions, so we don't ever want to give this to pregnant clients. All right, that is everything you need to know about acid-controlling medications for the NCLEX. You're going to do great.